By the way, did you see where this is Denise Graves? She sang at the uh, Washington Cathedral, the big service they had there on September 14th of 2001. And she is examining and the uplifting, healing, transforming power of music. This is the science behind the sounds that soothe, they say. One of the pages talks about healing harmonies. Scientists are developing research that shows physiological links between melody and the mind, a connection far greater than we ever imagined. Between melody and your mind. We'll talk to you later on about melody. But this is interesting. They recognize it. New studies indicate that listening to and playing music can actually alter how our brains and thus our bodies function. Doctors believe music therapy in hospitals and nursing homes not only makes people feel better, also makes them heal faster. Music therapy has become a major thing. All your major hospitals have music therapists in them. We're only beginning to understand the value of music, they say. We're tapping into the fundamental ways our brain interprets and drinks it in. A Boston doctor says music actually may affect brain size. The thick cable of neurons connecting the brain's right and left hemispheres was larger among musicians. The trend is even more pronounced for musicians who took up an instrument at an early age. This goes along with what we call the Mozart effect where they find that children who get involved in music do much better in school than other children do. Because it increases their brain size and increases the way their brains function. A director at the biomedical research said, music is hardwired into the brain. We're only now realizing how important it is to us. Whether or not people choose to recognize the power of music, it remains a spiritual experience. It can save us, Denise Graves says. Ah. Denise even went, underwent a brain scan to let the doctor study her brain. Her brain responded well to classical or art music, but did not to a rock group. Ah, interesting. USA Today, praise him with an upbeat. Presentations projected on huge video screens have all but replaced traditional hymnals. Many churches no longer have hymnals. These services feature elaborate lighting and bands that play ringing anthems in the mold of U2, one of the wildest rock groups there is out. It's upbeat and it's entertaining. There's just a power that takes you over, said one of the teenagers. I guess so. Many churches that major in this music tend to shed denominational names. One of the musicians says, when we worship as much as we do through music nowadays, songs just can't last. I guess not. They're not worth anything. That's why they don't last. USA Today says there's a tendency to create a top 40 or fast food mentality toward worship. They comment again, singing songs of the present may express deep, intimate emotions, but singing songs of the past ties the modern church to Christians across continents, across centuries. That's USA Today saying. Then one of the musicians says, what's great about the older hymns is they are very theologically sound. They take deep theological topics that are central to the whole basis of truth. Probably at that time that was great because people needed to sing truth. We don't need it anymore. <laughs> USA Today again. They say they have now transformed a song of defiance to one of faith. Taken the defiant music, which they openly admit is defiance, and they say now they can transform it and make it something real good. I submit it can't be done. So, if we want to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord, we need to go to the scripture. I'm not going to take the time. If you get the language of music videos, you'll get this in detail. A spiritual person is one who puts spirit first, mind second, and body last. That's a spiritual person. That's a very simple explanation. I can go into a lot of detail, but I'm not going to do it in this session. But I wanted to say that to you because in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And I want you to see that what I'm giving you is tied in with the will of God. I'm not reaching into a corner somewhere and trying to pull something out of a hat. I'm tying it in with the will of God, which is exactly what the scripture does. Because it goes on after it says we ought to know the will of God. It says, don't be drunk with wine, we're in his excess, but 
be filled with the Spirit. God wants you and me to be filled with His Spirit. And it's not an option, it's a command. When I get up here to speak to you, I want to be filled with God's Spirit. And let me also say to you that you need just as much of the filling of the Spirit to understand what I'm saying to you. Just as much. God says be filled with the Spirit. Now once God says we ought to be filled with the Spirit, what do you suppose the Scripture is going to talk about next? It says singing and making what? Melody in your heart to the Lord. In psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. The first thing God says after he says be filled with the Spirit is make what? Music. Make melody. That ought to show us how important it is to God. It's not an incidental matter. In fact, you'll say, find the same pattern in Colossians chapter 3, the companion passage to Ephesians 5, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Then it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I like what Francis Schaeffer says. He says, always define the words that you use so that everyone will know what you're talking about. If you've, if you've read any of Francis Schaeffer's books, he always at the back, he always puts in a glossary of terms so you can't miss out what he was saying. I think that's good. And the reason I mention that is because I want to talk about the words that are used in the scripture right here, Ephesians 5. It says, singing and making melody. The word for singing is ado, that's the verb. That's the Greek verb, okay? And it happens to be in a participle form, adantes. That's the verb for singing. The next term is the one that has fooled some people. Because the verb for making melody is salo. I put the English letters there, but that's the, the Greek verb, salo. Again, it's in a participle form, salantes. And it literally means to make melody. Now, I realize that a lot of the commentaries have missed out on this, and I think it's because they're not musicians. They think because the word solo is the root word from which we got our word psalm, it must mean to sing the psalms. That's not what it means. In fact, if you will check out any Greek dictionary, you'll find it's an instrumental term. And it literally means to make melody. That's exactly what it is talking about. You say, well, I'm not a musician. How am I know what melody is? Melody is the way music travels on a horizontal plane. Come thou fount of every blessing. That's the way music travels on a horizontal plane. That's the melody. That's the melody. I believe, based on this scripture and many others I could show you, that God wants any music that you and I have in our lives to be predominantly made up of melody. Even the world knows that's true. The greatest music the world knows anything about is called polyphonic music. That's music which is a combination of melodies. The world knows it's great, but they don't know why. You and I as Christians don't know why. Because God says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you want to make what? Melody. Notice it doesn't say singing and making rhythm. Could have said that, as I'll show you in just a few minutes. If you'll check out Vine's Dictionary, the authority on the Greek language, he says the word means to play on a stringed instrument with the fingers. It means to make melody. Now you might sing words along with it, but this is exactly what it's talking about. It's an instrumental term. In Ephesians 5.19, the word for sing is adantes or ado. The word for make melody is salantes or salo. If we were to go back to 1 Corinthians 14.15, in verse 15 it says, I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding also. What was our basic subject in those chapters? Yeah, tongues or languages. When he says, I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with understanding, he's talking about language. Then he refers back to his illustration. He says, I will, and the King James translates it, sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding. Guess which term it uses. The verb is solo. It should have been translated, I will make melody under the Spirit of God. I will make melody that I understand. So, I think melody is the best translation we could possibly have for that verb. And the melody ought to have the character of Christianity. I think this is a part of the problem today. You've got a whole bunch of music that does not reflect the character that God wants us to have. 
And what it reflects, I believe, is relativism. Let me give you a couple of examples of that, okay? Oh, Daddy, you know you make me cry. Right up on top of the microphone, licking on it. About to swallow it. She's making her voice just as sensual as she knows how. That was a secular performance. Now, now, this is a Christian performance. Exactly the same song. Here's another one. A little more rhythm in this one. But I want you to hear the voice. Wondering, waiting, restless for sound. You see, they've lost the fact of character. And what the, if you read the books that talk about it, the books in philosophy, books in psychology of music, ethnomusicology, they all recognize that that's the music of relativism. What they are saying is that nothing is absolute. And this is very interesting. Children who are not given any objective standard are 36% more likely to lie to their parents, 48% more likely to cheat on an exam, 74% more likely to watch MTV daily, two times more likely to hurt someone, to watch pornography or get drunk, and many times more likely to steal, use illegal drugs, or even to attempt suicide. That's from the Children's Defense Fund, a secular group. You see, relativism, you may say, well, what difference does relativism mean? It makes all the difference in the world, what a person believes. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's as absolute as you can make it. That's what our Christian music ought to show in any music we listen to. Some vocalists, they say, invite sensual thoughts by their voice inflection. Not by the words, by the way they use their voices. Territoriality, are you familiar with that? That's the physical limit that separates a person from his environment. Those singers I just played for you, not only the secular one, but the Christian ones, are violating your social zone. You have a social zone. That's within about four feet of you. You don't even want too many people in that zone. But you also have a personal zone. You don't even like too many people there. But then you'll have an intimate zone. By conditioned response, those women on those recordings are violating your intimate zone. See, how do you know? If one of those women would be here tonight and would walk up to any man in this room and talk to him like she's singing on the recording, he'd either start ducking away or his wife would help him. <laughs> Steve Camp who was in the rock for many years, says, Christian music yodels of a Christless, watered-down, God is my girlfriend kind of thing. But the record companies are saying, look, you've got a record company whose job it is to sell records. Ah. Secular media companies swallowed up more than 90% of Christian recording labels in the 1990s. You wonder why the music is like it is? 90% of the companies are not owned by Christians. They're owned by secular people who their only goal is to make money. That's all it's about. Even the Wall Street Journal says they're singing songs of love, not God. And what we have are what they call crossover songs. You familiar with those? Crossover songs are songs that they, they say they like to be tuned into both sides of the music business. In other words, you can appeal to the world or appeal to the, appeal to the church. You can appeal, appeal to both of them. The problem with that is it's like the fellow in the war between the states wore a Confederate coat and Union pants and got shot in both ends. 